Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Julio Friedman. I'm a senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Today, we are going to discuss carbon capture and storage uh, in Wyoming as a focus. Uh, this is a joint production between the United States Energy Association and Columbia University uh, and is done as part of our Women in Energy program. Let me quickly say that this event is being broadcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you may submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have an outstanding lineup today. Uh, I will introduce each of them uh, as they join the panel, but we have Dr. Holly Kuthra from uh, University of Wyoming, Sarah Forbes uh, from the Center on Environmental Quality in the White House, and Deepika Nagabushan from uh, Carbon Direct. At this moment though, I'm delighted to turn you over to Sheila Hollis. Sheila is the acting director of the United States Energy Association. Sheila, to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedman. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to join you here today on behalf of the United States Energy Association uh, and to uh, continue the dialogue on uh, women in energy and uh, women in a very complex and, uh, and challenging and timely issue. Uh, that is the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, in Wyoming uh, of CO2. So uh, happy on behalf of USEA to work so closely with Dr. Friedman and his wonderful uh, entourage of uh, staff uh, and colleagues. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists here today. I'm a former resident of Wyoming, so uh, uh, it's near and dear to my heart. And uh, this is certainly something as well that's of, of great interest to NARUC. Uh, was a key uh, program at NARUC as well. So it's an extremely timely issue and all eyes are on Wyoming and what Wyoming is able to do. So Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for inviting me and on behalf of USEA, we're honored and delighted to play a small part in this. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Sheila. We're delighted to have you here. Look forward to hearing more about your thoughts uh, later today. Uh, with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our outstanding panel. One of the things that's true is we are blessed with a super abundance of talent in the carbon capture and storage space. Uh, today is no exception. Uh, let me start by introducing Executive Director of the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming, Dr. Holly Krutka. Holly uh, came to the university after serving as the Vice President of Coal Generation and Emissions Control Technology at Peabody. Uh, she spent most of her career working on technology and policy pathways to advance carbon capture, as well as non-traditional coal consumption. Uh, she's worked as a senior researcher at Tri-State Gen and Transmission, uh, as executive director of the Cornerstone, the official journal of the world coal industry, and has participated in the Carbon Capture Coalition as a judge on the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize. Uh, although she is in Wyoming now, uh, she got her doctoral degree at University of Oklahoma in chemical engineering and is originally from Oklahoma. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, turn it over to Holly. Dr. Krutka, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. And really grateful to be here. Um, so I'll just speak a few minutes. I am here on the ground in Wyoming, joining you from beautiful Laramie, Wyoming today, where it is sunny and very, very cold. Um, and really grateful to be here because I feel, we feel like this is ground zero for CCUS deployment and we're working really hard to make that a reality here in Wyoming. So um, today during the course of the discussion, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, all the aspects of things we're, we're doing here in the state to try to build up a new industry. Um, we are a highly, we are a proud energy producing state. We produce um, 14 times more energy than we use in Wyoming. And as the energy mix changes, we have to look to new industries to support our economy. And we really believe 
that CCUS um, can be one of those industries. So let's talk just a little bit about things we've done here in Wyoming. So for example, um, on the capture side, we're working to advance novel capture technologies so that we have the Wyoming Integrated Test Center, which is hosted by Basin Electric's Dry Fork Power Plant in Campbell County, Wyoming. Um, that is a test center for novel capture and use technologies. So if you're not familiar with the Integrated Test Center, it is one of two test centers in the US, the other being the National Carbon Capture Center. And um, we have several small bays to test earlier stage te technologies, as well as a large test, test bay that can test pilot scale te technologies. And at the 10 megawatt MTR, it's membrane um, technology is gonna be tested there um, in 2022. So really excited about everything happening there. We have worked on transport here in Wyoming and we have the Wyoming Pipeline Corridor Initiative and hope we'll hopefully we'll talk about that, but we also have existing CO2 pipelines in Wyoming and now we've done work to try to build up our infrastructure on CO2 pipelines in Wyoming. Um, we've worked a lot on storage. So we've both worked both on the technical side. So a lot of that work has um, been led here by the uh, School of Energy Resources and our collaborators at the University of Wyoming. We are leading one of the carbon safe projects. So obviously ours is the Wyoming carbon safe project we're really excited about. Um, and I hope to talk about that later today too. We're, we're really moving forward with that project and about to uh, drill our second well. Um, um, we've also, our, our state legislature and our federal delegation have both been, they've been very proactive on the policy side in trying to make Wyoming a home for CCUS projects. And um, with what's happened at the federal level with the enhancements in 45Q, um, for the first time, I think we're really seeing a lot of commercial activity. So we're really excited about the state of CCUS and we're hoping that all the work the state um, of Wyoming, its researchers, its industry has done over the years is going to launch a, a commercial industry and we're starting to see that happen. So um, look forward to talking more in details today. And I think the last thing I would add is um, you should all know that, that the citizens of Wyoming are interested in this. So we've done some polling um, on the social side and the social license to operate for CCUS and the state citizens are supportive. So really a great place to be and look forward to, to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Outstanding. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I was planning on pivoting over to Sarah Forbes, but she's still having some issues joining us. So with that, I'm gonna take a moment uh, instead and interact, introduce uh, Deepika Nagabhushan. Uh, I've had the good fortune of knowing Deepika for many, many years uh, as an extraordinary actor. Uh, Deepika is currently at Carbon Direct uh, in that role. She serves, uh, well, let me say it this way. She's, she serves several roles, but uh, uh, among other things is a client uh, engagement officer she comes to Carbon Direct from the Clean Air Task Force, uh, where she worked for many years. Uh, she is a deep expert on policy, uh, on uh, environmental issues, as well as business issues in the world of carbon capture, use, and storage. Deepika, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Julio. Um, hi, everyone. So happy to be here. Um, I'm Deepika Nagabhushan. I, uh, and of course, as Julio said, it's only been a handful of weeks that I started working at Carbon Direct as my project manager, and it's it's a new role. Um, and when I got invited to be on the panel, I was still at the time uh, working at Clean Air Task Force. So I actually bring two hats to the panel today. Um, and I want to sort of talk about the perspectives that I want to, to bring to this conversation. Um, so while I was at CATF and I was leading the program on carbon capture policy, I was very interested in, the, in, in sort of figuring out what kind of appropriate policies are required both at the federal level as well as at the state level across uh, multiple states in the US uh, to advance uh, deployment of CCS um, from, a, from a capture side, from storage side, from the whole ecosystem perspective. Um, and I spent, uh, you know, biggest project that I was working on while I was at CATF was to push the enhancements on 45Q. I was also part of pushing uh, 45Q, implementing 45Q in the, in the first round in 2018. Um, I also spent a lot of time in California. Um, I mean, I live here, so I um, 
I spent a lot of time working on the LCFS, which is a low carbon fuel standard, uh, which is one of California's policies that embraces and allows uh, both carbon capture and direct air capture projects to take advantage of the market. Um, and the second hat that I'm wearing is the one that I now have at Carbon Direct, where I have a slightly different perspective to uh, the ecosystem around carbon capture, where I'm looking at what kind of voluntary, uh, what kind of impact and, and market pull uh, can come from the voluntary markets. Um, currently, we work with one of, you know, some of the largest uh, uh, companies that are, that have set themselves very bold climate targets. Uh, everyone wants to invest in, you know, invest in getting themselves to uh, net zero uh, through the use of some uh, quality offsets, as well as uh, it, they are, some, some clients are interested in, in helping build up the supply for uh, offsets because there's not a whole lot currently. Um, so I think that I bring that perspective and sort of I want to explore the question of what kind of role uh, Wyoming plays. Of course, Holly outlined uh, exactly the role that Wyoming will play in advancing CCS from an engineered standpoint, both ca capture, storage. Um, I'm also interested to talk about how that implementation can occur from, you know, from a perspective of upholding um, environmental justice principles, because that's a very important um, um, uh, piece of the puzzle, I would say. Um, and then also uh, think about potential for nature-based solutions or soil carbon solutions that potentially uh, vast lands in uh, Wyoming could take advantage of, um, given the voluntary market is sort of growing at a rapid pace right now. So those are the two perspectives I wanted to explore today in today's panel. Um, happy to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Deepika. Uh, it seems like we're still having some issues with uh, Sarah. So uh, why don't we start in and as soon as she arrives, we can then uh, thread her into the conversation. Um, a couple of sort of quick questions here on this. Uh, I, I recall years ago, uh, uh, an predecessor of yours, Holly, a guy named uh, uh, Dog Numidal would call Wyoming the big empty. Uh, he liked the fact that there was not only incredible opportunity in terms of energy, but also an opportunity in terms of storage resource. Uh, and you'd mentioned the carbon safe project uh, that you're involved in. Could you just take a little bit, talk about some of the uh, units and formations where you think you can store CO2 and how Wyoming is thinking about those, not just technically, but also uh, from a perspective of the state. Sure. So um, I'm going to answer your second question first, because I do think the state is looking to figure out how we can monetize CO2 storage and provide income streams. And so we're thinking about our, our pore space actually as, as not as a mineral, but as an asset, certainly for the state. Um, we are one of the only states that's really done the level of work required to fully um, characterize two, um, two storage formations with a lot of other work around the state underway. And um, I, I think that we have to start um, not with the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project with the Rock Springs Uplift. So that is in Sweetwater County. And this Rock Springs Uplift is truly a world-class CO2 storage site. Um, storage estimates are as high as um, maybe 25 billion tons. Um, so that would be all of the emissions from Wyoming for 400 years if we could fully access that, um, that storage site. So really excited about that area. We also have um, a nice concentration of different types of um, CO2 sources around the Rock Springs Uplift. And so, um, and I think one of the it's not just Rock Springs Uplift, but most of Wyoming um, is is the big empty. And so this is, um, while we, we don't feel like there's a lot of risk associated with CO2 storage at the Rock Springs Uplift for anyone concerned about uh, risks, there is, there is very little um, in the surrounding area. So it's a great place to demonstrate this technology. Um, our other location that, that is currently underway, um, so we're studying very actively now is adjacent to Basin Electric's Dry Fork Power Plant. Um, and that is part of the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. And just like all the Carbon Safe Projects, we are focused on developing um, a commercial scale CO2 storage site. And um, I am so sorry that I do not have the formations off the top of my head, but I will put them, um, 
out there as soon as I get them. I'm going to send an email to one of the geologists. And right. It's okay. I know you're looking at the muddy formation. Yeah. Uh, muddy is one. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, anyways, thanks for helping me out. I am a chemical yep. engineer, as everyone heard in my bio, not a, not a geologist. So Julio right. can fill in the blanks. <laughs> the muddy, the frontier, the phosphoria. There's a bunch of formations yep. you're looking at there. At the, just for the audience, uh, a carbon safe project has a minimum storage requirement of 50 million tons. Um, it, this project is up in the Powder River Basin. Uh, what do you think is likely to be, again, the volumes and storage volumes? So, um, I have a note here, don't let John forget it's a point. Okay, Sheila, can we ask you to mute, please? I'm sorry. So that's, we haven't, we haven't set targets per se for the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project yet. Like you said, that the, the absolute minimum is 50 million tons with an injection rate of minimum of 2 million tons per year. We do think that the, the storage capacity is much, much higher than that, but we're not ready to like exactly put a number on it. So, um, but, but it, it is, it is, it's probably not the scale of the, the Rock Springs uplift, but we do think it's a very large, um, opportunity and there there again we have quite a few um co2 sources in that area so we're we're really interested in um expanding research on on that side as well excellent uh, uh i, I want to come back to questions of sort of the point sources and the kinds of things that one can do in the state of wyoming but before that i want to ask actually about the communities uh and this is for for both of you um you know, the, the uh, one of the questions or concerns that frequently is voiced around CCS is how do communities think about it? Uh, how do you think about that in the context of other environmental burdens? Uh, how do you think about that in terms of questions of equity and justice? I'm wondering if, starting with Deepika, if you could talk a bit about your own experience in thinking through this, again, with, through the prism of Wyoming, if you can, and then uh, go back to Dr. Krutka. Sure, I can uh, take that. Um, so one of the few uh, principles, or one of the many principles uh, of environmental justice would be to ensure that communities where projects, in industrial infrastructure, which, you know, CCS is going to be, you know, putting steel in the ground, um, that we kind of not repeat uh, approaches that have been used in the past where potentially the communities where these industrial infrastructure uh, uh, is built, uh, the communities did not have a say in where it went and um, how it was built and uh, who benefited from it and who bore the burden. Um, so the most important thing to do right now would be to um, ensure that there are regulatory processes that are creating transparent you know, uh, communi community engagement pr uh, processes and are allowing communities to have access to the right kind of information and are empowered to make independent decisions and contribute, you know, uh, to the and influence decision making uh, about infrastructure that will go in their uh, th their land that might have an impact on livelihoods or that might have an impact in in terms of health uh, uh, and and those kinds of things. So I think uh, that would be the key. I don't necessarily have a specific perspective on local communities in Wyoming, but in California, this is a very important issue, and I suppose that that could be you know it's not it's not it wouldn't be different from what might be required to do uh, in Wyoming. Um, in California, for instance, one of the key areas of questions are is about uh, emissions, uh, harmful emissions from industrial infrastructure. Will carbon capture uh, increase those emissions? Will carbon capture decrease or do nothing? What, what is that? What, what does that mean for the local communities? Um, and also uh, water quality is another issue that constantly comes up when it comes to storage and many, I think it also is it it go it sort of talks to speaks to the fact that there is a need to create a lot of awareness and create access to information about what storage really is and and I think that with Wyoming it might be there is an advantage given that there is an industry that already exists and understands what you know subsurface uh, you know using uh, the subsurface and there's also a very skilled workforce that exists so I feel like there might be some advantages there already but of course. Uh, some of these principles uh, will have to be actively upheld in terms of community engagement, in terms of not exploiting or not disrupting local livelihoods that de depend on land. Um, so. Terrific. Um, let, Holly, do you think that we can answer those questions well? And how do people in Wyoming think about this? Yeah, 
certainly. So we have done, we, we've been engaged um, with citizens of Wyoming at, throughout our CCUS research. And we, we, in conjunction with the Hobbs School of Environment and Natural Resources, we, we did a, a study across the state last year. And we did find that um, across the state, um, in general, Wyomingites are very supportive of CCUS, probably much more so than other states. Um, so if you add, um, I'm going to give you some numbers. So 37.8% believe CCS is important to keep Wyoming fuels, fossil fuels competitive in the marketplace. Um, and then another 30% support CCS because it should be adopted to reduce carbon emissions. So there you're almost up to 70% um, between those two groups that are supportive for different reasons. We have still work to do. We have 32% of respondents that weren't sure. So we still have work to do in reaching out to our community. But if you look at those that that answered um, that we shouldn't we should focus on renewables. Uh, there could be harmful side effects, too expensive and not important. Um, those those all added up to less than 30 percent. So um, <clears throat> we we um, we're we're very interested in continuing that outreach. But in general, Wyoming Wyomingites are are supportive of CCUS. I do think one question we get that you might not get everywhere is what's going to happen to Wyoming minerals. So not water, but um, our, our bread and butter and our oil and gas production in particular. Um, and so we have to, we do have to keep explaining that <clears throat> storage is not going to impact the water table. It's not going to impact minerals in the state. So, um, and I would say this kind of public outreach is part of all all our projects and it's it's even part of required by the department of energy for that funding so it, it's part of everything we do and i think we're making progress um i would say i also think one of the reasons wyomingites are are familiar is because we are in an energy state they are very comfortable with this kind of work but also um they see it as an opportunity so um particularly for oil and gas operators potentially they could transition to be carbon management um, companies and and have a part of this future and, and look to retain those jobs here in the state and build a new industry out of CCUS. So generally we're doing good. We still have work to do though. Marvelous. Uh, and uh, I, with that, I'm going to uh, take a moment here. What, one, uh, one last point, uh, Holly, on what you just said. It reminds me that uh, often a question that comes in in Wyoming that is different from other places is how might CCS affect ranching, which is something that uh, is a fair question to ask there. But uh, we are finally uh, able to hear from the remarkable Sarah Forbes, who has finally joined us by phone. We're still working to getting her screen up, but we're keen to have her share the conversation and her perspective uh, already. Uh, I've had the good fortune of knowing Sarah again for many, many years. Right now, she is the Director of Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage at the Executive Office of the President, uh, where she works at the Council for Environmental Quality. Uh, she has spent many years at the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, and uh, among other things before that, has also worked as a senior associate at the World Resource Institute and at National Energy Technology Lab. Uh, she has a master's from Mississippi State University and has lived all over the country and done all kinds of remarkable things. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to your thoughts and comments. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I am sorry we couldn't get the, the video feed working. Um, but I, I want to talk just briefly about the work that is happening at the Council on Environmental Quality in CCS. And then a couple of, and then I'll make a couple of points that that tie to um, the discussion we were just having. So, the Use It Act um, was included in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And the reason I'm at CEQ is because that language gave CEQ three specific things to do on CCS. Um, they are all focused on identifying and inventorying existing permitting requirements and best practices with an aim of advancing efficient, orderly, and responsible development of CCS projects at increased scale in the United States. Uh, the first thing um, that CEQ was tasked with doing was a report on CCS, which was published in June. And if we have time, I'd be happy to, to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the 
issues that were flagged in that report that the Council on Environmental Quality is going to continue working on in time. The second, and the thing that I've been focused on lately, is guidance to the federal agencies. Um, so the Council on Environmental Quality, the White House, will be issuing guidance to the federal agencies for things they can do right now to facilitate the efficient, orderly, and responsible deployment of CCS in the United States. And the third thing is to establish task forces. Um, they, they, there will be at least two task forces per the congressional language, and those task forces will be tasked with reviewing that guidance that is to be issued this year on an annual basis and submitting a report um, to the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, to tie into the discussion we were just having on, on community engagement um, and on Wyoming in specifically, there are two points that I'd, I'd like to make. Um, and then there's a, there's a third thing I'll say before I turn it back. Um, so the, the president is committed to accelerating the responsible deployment of CCS, and, and we can talk about how that's evidenced. But I want to underscore two things. Um, first, CCS will, will only deliver the desired societal and environmental benefits, climate-related or otherwise, if its deployment is well-designed and well-governed. And so one of the things that we're particularly focused on in the administration is the role CCS can play in creating good paying union jobs and addressing the cumulative impacts in historically disadvantaged and overburdened communities. So this is, all, this is in the context because when we talk about the scale of implementation of CCS and carbon removal that matters at a climate perspective, um, it raises concerns about public health and environmental impacts and questions about who stands to benefit from the deployment of these systems. So in thinking about orderly, responsible, and efficient CCS deployment, responsible projects address cumulative pollution and incorporate environmental justice and equity considerations. We talk a lot about community outreach, about community engagement. One of the things we can start thinking about is, is how to involve the community in decisions. And um, Finally, I, I mentioned the report, and if time allows, there are lots of issues we'll probably touch that, um, that will we'll hit on things that were in the report. But one thing I want to mention before I turn it over is the Infrastructure and Jobs Act actually hit on a number and addressed a number of the issues that we flagged in June in the CEQ report as areas that needed work um, to move CCS forward. And so um, as we go through the conversation, I'll, I'll try to find places to highlight those provisions because, you know, even over the last couple of months, Congress has taken action at the federal level that does facilitate the efficient, orderly, and responsible de deployment of CCS. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if we can bring the other panelists back in here, uh, Holly and Deepika, uh, and uh, Sheila, you're also welcome to join us. We don't want you to feel excluded if you wish to join in too. Thank you. Uh, so again, uh, we now have the whole team here. Uh, I'm happy to dive into the questions in just a minute, but first, uh, hold on a second. I just want to remind folks that uh, I'm Julio Friedman as your moderator. I'm here with Dr. Holly Krutzka, Executive Director of the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources, Sarah Forbes, uh, the Director of Carbon Capture and Storage at the Center on Environmental Quality, Executive Office of the President, Sheila Hollis, the Acting Executive Director of the United States Energy Association, and Deepika Nagabushan, uh, Client Project Manager at Carbon Direct. We are discussing carbon capture and storage in Wyoming. Uh, we're going to move back to our moderated discussion. Uh, we will open to questions from the audience in a bit. We're already collecting some of your questions, and I'm trying to thread them in. But we will formally do that in a little bit. Uh, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you can submit questions for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'd actually like to start uh, with uh, a couple of the things you just said, Sarah specifically thinking about uh, the role of other government agencies. Uh, earlier, we were talking about poor volume access, and this is something that falls squarely in Wyoming within the realm of BLM, uh, the Bureau of Land Management at the Department of the Interior. I would wonder if you just take a minute uh, and comment on your conversations there with them, and then think about how that can help uh, commercial entities developing projects and get sort of 
uh, Deepika's and Holly's thoughts from there. Thank you. This um, this is one of the issues um, that that has been flagged not just in the report that CEQ issued in June, but in in previous interagency task forces. President Obama convened an interagency task force that that highlighted the need to make progress on this. So one of the things that that we flagged in the report was thinking about federal lands broadly. What does it take to to permit and and what's the process for for leasing poor space? And so we've been working with the Department of Interior and we'll we'll continue to do so as well as the other federal agencies who who manage land. That that is an issue that um, that we flagged in the report and can be taken up in the guidance. Excellent. I will Uh, add one thing. Can I add one more thing? Um, So one of the areas so it's an issue, you know, across. I'm sorry, Sarah, we're having issues hearing you. I don't know what just happened. Sarah, we'll get back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, perhaps we can, uh, in the meantime, head to uh, Deepika's uh, and Holly's sort of thoughts on those things. How how can we think about, uh, thank you, how can we think about um, poor volume access and how companies uh, can think about planning and uh, execution in that context? Do you want to go first? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'll just add, I mean, I think this is a really important issue, especially for us here in Wyoming. Half of our land is federally managed. We also have checkerboard space, which means that the impact of federal lands is actually quite a bit larger than than just the federal lands themselves. So if we have a checkerboard of state and federal lands, um, we have to be able to lease poor space on federal lands, even if the ejection of CO2 occurs on state lands. And so I, I think it's really, really critical. Um, we are we are really honored to be, um, so our uh, SCR faculty member, uh, Tara Getty is working with Senator Barrasso staff to support them. And I hope that there will be some movement on this at the federal level. So first of all, I just wanna say, this is really important. Thank you for covering it because we see this as one of our most important issues. But um, I will say in the near term, there are very real implications. We have commercial developers looking at CCUS projects in the state. So if they can't get large enough state or um, private lands for their injection, um, then then they are, and they can't figure out how to lease federal pore space, they might look at enhanced oil recovery instead of CO2 storage in the near term, despite all the work we've done on the CO2 storage side. So we're very hopeful that, that there can be um, some really clear guidance on how to lease that federal poor space um, in the near term. So, um, and I think I, I'm going to respond to the point that Julio you brought up, which is the, what are the, what what can be the commercial opportunity here uh, with regard to poor space. And I, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was at CATF, uh, which was a long time ago, um, it, it's uh, the, the when you think about the fact that we are um, not really capturing and storing a whole lot of CO2 right now, and we have to get to like say 300 million tons a year in 2030, we don't really have much time. But and 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 when you think about that and compare in, and compare it to the is, issue of like every single capture project needing to find its storage partner or build a storage uh, site, find a storage site themselves, get the permitting done, which could take you know maybe a year or maybe long, give or take, uh, maybe longer than that, depends on state by state. And given the primacy, uh, state primacy now uh, uh, in Wyoming, that might make things easier um, and faster even. Uh, But uh, the fact that every project that is going to capture their CO2 has to still sort of answer the question of where that CO2 will go, can be the cause of, um, I would say, uh, slowing down uh, rapid deployment of the of the technology. So one of the opportunities that might exist is to have a commercial storage operator that can do large scale basin scale storage that can then be a, a, a sort of a 
a one-stop shop, sort of a big, you know, known off-taker for anyone that wants to capture CO2. Um, and it's sort of an, a business model that could be explored, uh, which, you know, could be similar to power, uh, power grids that, you know, power plants connect to the grid where they're built. So, so, so something like that could be, I would say, an opportunity, and it will probably take uh, collaboration from um, the carbon safe projects and all the partners that it has, and of course, you know, uh, private players as well. So I just thought that that would be important. And the other thing that I, I know we're not touching upon nature-based uh, or non-engineered uh, solutions uh, much today, but I did want to sort of throw something out there. Um, so in my new role at Carbon Direct, I help uh, corporate clients um, figure out their offset strategy and offsets largely tend to be in the in the nature based um, uh, carbon solution space uh, rather than engineered I mean it's not that it's exclusively nature based but it's very largely so um, and one of the things that I have read about recently uh, as I've started upon my new role is that there is opportunity for soil based carbon storage and given the vast lands in 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 the state of Wyoming, um, one of the opportunities what I'm reading about is that um, there might be some restrictions or sort of because a lot of ranchers might use land that is leased from BLM, there are certain rules that apply in terms of how, what kind of grazing practices or what kind of soil management practices that are allowed. Um, but, uh, but if there was flexibility in that area, that there might be opportunities for um, creating you know, um, financial opportunities, commercial opportunities for ranchers to store carbon from a so soil carbon perspective. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I know that isn't this isn't related to poor volume, but I thought well, that would be an interesting opportunity. As well. it, it's not related to poor volume. I do want to come back to issues of CO2 removal broadly, not just the soil base, but other approaches as well. Before I do though, two things. One of them is uh, Sarah is back with us. So thank you for joining us again and sorry for all the technical issues. Um, I, I want to get to a couple of related questions to your first point, but first, uh, in thinking about poor volumes, you're thinking about commercial projects, there's also a whole set of regulatory issues, there's permitting, there's legal issues. I thought that uh, Sheila might have a perspective on some of that. Yes, indeed, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Friedman, for allowing me to speak. Um, USEA is looking at these issues broadly, too, let me say. We're, we're working, we've worked in 104 countries around the world, so and many of them are coal dependent. And to the extent that the ideas that are being explored here and, and proof of concept that's being developed here, it can move uh, beyond wonderful Wyoming, which I adore and love in the United States, but around the world into those parts of the world that desperately need to get grip on the, on the coal utilization and to, uh, to use the CO2 developments, the CO2 storage developments that you, you are focused so well on uh, it is something that really could uh, benefit the world. And so uh, starting in Wyoming is a great place to do it because Wyoming is a place where things can happen, where there's uh, a lot of ener energy interest, but still concern for environment. Uh, and that balancing is done very well in, in Wyoming. Uh, and it, it is a lesson for the world. And that's what that's one of the reasons why USEA is so supportive of this project, other than Dr. Friedman and the wonderful people on the panel, uh, is to make this something that, that moves beyond Wyoming, beyond the United States and around the world. Canada could be of assistance, certainly Mexico, but, uh, but way beyond. Uh, and really uh, what you're doing is, is, is going to do humanity a lot of good. So thank you. Can I make a comment? I do think, you know, when we when we here in Wyoming think about CCUS, we are trying to demonstrate the technology here. We're trying to build an industry, but um, our fuels, the, the, the reason Wyoming got so excited about CCUS in the first place is our fuels are, we, like I said, we produce 14 times more energy than we use. So we are trying to be a leader in developing this technology in, in so, but if it, it's only deployed here, it's going to make a much smaller difference than if it's deployed more broadly. So I, I totally agree with, with everything that was just said. I, I think it's, it's absolutely critical to Wyoming that this technology is is used uh, much more broadly. So, and then if I could build on one thing, 
uh, Dapika, you said about commercial scale CO2 or commercial CO2 storage operators is that one other thing, the way we think about it is if this is a natural resource, if pore space is a resource, then having the um, CO2 storage really optimized by a single entity that's going to value that is, is really critical for us, you know, because there's only so much to grow around. So I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to say that we're thinking the same as well, that there could be some real advantages. God, there's so many threads to jump on here. I don't even know quite where to go. Uh, but I, before I come back to that point, Holly, though, and this is, I want to really explore this with, with you, with Sarah and Sheila in particular. Um, uh, I want to post on ch the chat function for everyone the White House study that Sarah was talking about earlier. Uh, so the, the CEQ report on CCUS. Uh, uh, and if there's others uh, that we should post, feel free to send them to me and we will share them. Um, one of the ideas that's been floating around for a long time to optimize the pore volume usage is in fact a CO2 utility. The idea that this is not done by a, a handful of companies, say Occidental and Schlumberger or some others, but is actually something that is managed by the state or by a, a conglomeration of states or a confederation of states uh, in serving the optimization of that resource. And I wanted to know if any of you had thoughts on that, just because you've been off, Sarah, if you would like to sort of volunteer to start on that, but please everybody chime in. I'll be happy to start. And uh, before I talk about the utility and, and operations um, and opportunities there, one thing, um, you know, in, we, we talked about the need for clarity on leasing poor space on federal lands. But one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't say right now is that the federal government has an existing regulatory framework that's rigorous and capable of permitting, of, of managing permitting and review actions for CCS projects. And that's evidenced by the, the projects that are, are moving forward right now. So we talk about areas where there's lack of a clarity, but from the big picture, the, the United States has the most developed um, regulatory framework as well as incentive package um, for, for CCS. And, and that is, you know, when I think about the utility and, and what it would take to make it happen, one of the, the questions is that, that pipeline, how do you get the excess capacity in a pipeline? And the Infrastructure and Jobs Act had a, a new program, the Carbon Dioxide Transportation Infrastructure Finance Innovation, or CIFIA. I think people might call it CIFIA, but I'm not sure. Um, and what that does is provides federal loans that will that will allow an entity to build a pipeline that's bigger than what they need so it it provides a, a real incentive now that could enable that the type of storage utility to move forward and i'm more optimistic about the concept um, than i was before the president signed the infrastructure and jobs act thanks i want to come back to the infrastructure questions in just a second because that's like a hugely important thing for me but uh, I want to actually go to first, I think, to Holly and then maybe Deepika. Wyoming has an additional aspect or dimension to its work. You guys have class six primacy. We do. So if you'd like to talk about why you did that and what that means, that'd be welcome. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we, we have class six primacy simply because um, we do want these projects to go forward. We have to have the same rigorous standards as um, anyone who gets a permit from the federal EPA, but the Wyoming DEQ runs our primacy and our permitting efforts here. And um, I should say we here at the School of Energy Resources, we've submitted, we're trying to get what we think might be the first class six well in Wyoming, but not sure because there is competition. Um, we are, our approach is actually, um, we're getting class one well doing some tests and then converting to class six. But um, the, the whole point is that we think um, we, can, we can achieve the same rigorous standards um, for our class six permitting, but do it faster. So we don't know the exact time scale because no one's gotten one, but we are in the process. So um, I would say that's part of Wyoming Carbon Safe, which is a research project. So we are trying to um, grease the skids, <laughs> keep get things moving and, and get through the process once to make it faster for commercial developers. But one of the things we're doing um, out on public outreach is on December 16th, we are actually hosting a webinar with all the entities you would have to go through um, state lands and DEQ and then us here at the school to try to help commercial entities get to that class six permit. So we, we, we as a state, we have primacy and now we're really trying to leverage that to, to bring projects here versus other places. 
Sheila, you want to jump in on that? I, I do. I was wondering, uh, are you looking to a framework such as what exists for oil pipelines that are only regulated for rates? I hate to get into the tacky part of the face of rates and, and also access and how access is doled out uh, versus the classic um, FERC regulation of interstate pipelines. Uh, it's more limited with respect to, to oil pipelines and products pipelines. Um, is there anything you can take from federal law which would be useful and applicable vis-a-vis -vis oil pipelines and, and the way that they are approved? Obviously, if they're intrastate, uh, typically there's no approval necessary by, by FERC. Uh, but if they're intrast, interstate pipelines, certainly natural gas, hyper-regulated. But even with respect to the interstate pipelines, it becomes a rate, uh, a rate and access issue. So. Uh, I don't know if you're looking at all these uh, uh, hairy uh, legal regulatory issues that have a way of uh, ensnaring projects, the greatest ideas in the world, stopping them cold. I think for the most part, we've only looked at in interstate, so inside Wyoming pipelines. Um, and we probably haven't gotten into all the issues you described, but we do have existing pipelines in Wyoming, as most people know. And then we have launched and executed the Wyoming Pipeline Corridor Initiative, which um, established corridors on public lands for um, dedicated CO2 pipelines. And it connected, um, a lot of this was, was led um, in conjunction with the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute um, and other stakeholders across the state of Wyoming. Um, but it connected CO2 sources with oil fields suitable for CO2 enhanced oil recovery and um, geologic sequestration. So the idea was lowering the cost for industry up front and facilitating permitting. So we, you know, as a state, we have looked at some of these things inside the state borders um, and, but, but have not gone that extra step um, that you mentioned of cross anything. What about tribal borders. lands? What about tribal lands, Dr. Holly? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think we've crossed any of those. It's, it's, I think we focus on federal lands um, exclusively. So, yeah. Outstanding. Um, in that exact context, uh, I will be moving to questions of CO2 removal in just a minute, but I do want to dwell a little more on infrastructure here. Uh, infrastructure really helps a commercial project. If you have a CO2 pipeline, it makes it much easier to launch. You can connect to resources like the Rock Springs Uplift, which you might not be able to access some other way. Um, uh, we have this new Department of Transportation loan program, CIFIA, that Sarah had mentioned, the Use It Act. Uh, allows pipelines for CO2 to be eligible for fast path permitting. Um, and again, in Wyoming, it's not hypothetical. You guys have thousands of miles of CO2 pipelines already and a long list of experience of this. Like, how do you think about, it, as well as like the transmission lines, as well as all this other infrastructure, how do you think about these first in terms of a magnet for industry? How do you, and also as an opportunity to grow uh, CO2 storage as a service. Maybe Deepika actually start with you on that one. How do you got both with your CATF hat on and also as your carbon direct hat on, what's the value proposition of pipelines and, and how do you, you assess them? Yeah, no, I think that what Sarah sort of mentioned earlier about, you know, oversizing uh, pipelines is the kind of policy that we really need to build out the ecosystem. You know, for in, let, let's just a silly example would be like, if there was an internet, like we wouldn't have all of these tech companies like and if it weren't all, you know if it, like for instance if there weren't roads and if there were there was an internet we wouldn't have like DoorDash that would deliver you food when you couldn't go to a restaurant and dine in um so the point is it's just like that it's like roads it's so pipelines are just super important to actually have um uh, the, 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 the source and the sink connected. And I think that like what Holly was saying, um, having a single sort of strategic, single point of strategy where you can actually optimize resource in such a way that you can actually have super highways of these pipelines that can then be connected to by smaller projects. Um, it can actually be more optimal in terms of usage of resources. The other thing is also uh, while it's such a, uh, uh, it, a paradigm that uh, we, we have abundance of storage resources, but uh, it would be kind of, it, we can get to a point where we have surface infrastructure 
um, competition where like maybe there is other infrastructure that already exists in more, the most optimal location for accessing that that core space. So th there will need to be some planning so as to not block off other projects from accessing the most optimal location or injection sites. So I think from that perspective, infrastructure is so key, not only to just have this ready-made structure that one can plug into, uh, but also to optimize the resource from a state perspective in order to reach those climate goals broadly, um, I think from both, both perspectives, I think uh, infrastructure is key. Right, uh, Sarah, you wanted to add on to that and then maybe Holly too? I do. So um, Julio mentioned the FAST 41, and um, there was a, a pipeline project that, that actually went through the FAST 41 process, a CO2 pipeline project last year, and the decision was, was made in January. And now that CCS is, is, a, is a new category um, that's covered not only carbon dioxide pipelines, but also all of the infrastructure for carbon capture in a CCOS project broadly will qualify for FAST 41. And one of the issues that, and, and there's a bit of detail about that in, in the report that's linked in the chat. And working with agencies on FAST 41 implementation is, is one of the activities that CEQ plans to um, do going forward. Thanks. Marvelous. Well, our neighbors to the north in Canada have already done a lot of this sort of thing. So if we want to be competitive, we've got to do the same. Holly, any additional thoughts on infrastructure? Not too much. I, I just think um, we are a little, it's concerning. Um, I think in if we can't get this large infrastructure build out, I think we'll have one-off projects. And I think that that increases risk. So it is a high priority to, to have these pipelines just so you have multiple CO2 storage options. Um, as opposed to, you know, one source, one sink. Mm -hmm. So really high priority for us, but um, don't have too much to add. Excellent. I'm going to get to CO2 removal in a moment, but first I want to talk about the incentives packages that are out there. And uh, not only do we have 45Q existing and amended already, but we have proposed expansions of it. We have accommodations in the bipartisan infrastructure plan for things like hydrogen hubs, potential hydrogen production tax credit, as well as a, a um, sequestration tax credit with 45Q. Uh, uh, maybe starting with Sarah, but then opening it up to anybody, sort of what's the status of these things and what's, how will they change the way that companies think about these investments? And if you can, like how much more tonnage will we get? If we go from $50 today to $85, like how many more tons and how many more projects will we see? I'm happy to start the discussion, and you know I'll say that the Build Back, the Build Back Better Act, um, which which has passed the House um, but not the Senate, had a number of provisions that were consistent um, with what the president has proposed, and works to overall improve the functionality by by doing the following things: um, extending the timeline, enabling direct pay, and providing increased um, credit values. Um, just for order of magnitude, um, it's a, a, an $85 per ton boost for um, all point source carbon capture with saline storage and um, $60 a ton for enhanced oil recovery. And then a boost of um, $180 a ton for direct air capture with saline storage and $130 a ton for direct air capture with EOR. That's just some of the latest language. It could, have, of course, it could of course change. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll end there and, and let the others talk about how businesses view it. I, I'll just say that um, you know, 45Q has changed a lot. And what I have observed is as the credit values go up, so do the number of proposed projects and the increased interest in, in CCS, um, both in Wyoming as well as across the country. Marvelous. Maybe Deepika, we can uh, ask you about what the impact of these kinds of incentives might be. Um, so in back in 2018, when the 45Q uh, revisions happened and we got the, 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 the current level, got to the current levels at $35 and $50 a ton, I remember we did an economic study that said that we could get about 49 million metric tons. I have not recently done the or kept in touch with some of the recent analysis, but I can tell you 
uh, that uh, that was only for the, uh, the uh, power sector. I'm so sorry. So I just, you know, that's beyond that. Uh, it, it would be more than that if we consider the, the low cost um, industrial sector, for, for instance, chemical processing or ethanol facilities. Um, with $85 and $60 a ton, I think that it really changes the game on, on a lot of applications of CCS. Definitely the more harder uh, uh, to do um, projects like cement and, and, and steel um, that are going to be so important because there is uh, not so much of an option. Um, you can't just switch uh, to renewables uh, when it comes to cement production or, or steel because mo some of those uh, emissions are, most of those emissions actually, in the case of cement, it's like 60% of those emissions come from the chemistry itself rather than energy use. So carbon capture is very important. And so with industrial, I think even natural gas fired pro uh, uh, power plants would, would benefit from a higher value because uh, the issue with, with natural gas uh, power plants is that they relatively, uh, relative to coal fired power plants, they emit like half the tons per megawatt hour. So while 45Q was sort of a designed, it was designed to, ben to benefit more tons being captured. What that did for natural gas was that it was almost penalizing natural gas fired power plants for, for having fewer emissions to then offset the cost of the capture system. So with a higher number, uh, with a higher value on 45Q, I think that that issue really does get resolved to a large extent and allows more projects to get in the green um, with, with these. Um, I don't necessarily have a big number. I, I could assume that it, it could capture you know, t tens of millions of tons more uh, with higher levels. I guess I'll, I'll just add, you know, at the risk of asking a now academic what what companies think or businesses think, we are we are working with the private sector. Um, we do know of commercial projects that have not yet gotten to uh, FID to to make that final investment decision. I I think there's no question that it, increasing the um, the value of the 45Q tax credit would push them over the edge and make this really happen. And then you have to think about uh, does this become a positive feedback cycle where you can um, start to see the cost of CCUS come down um, and and we can see more projects launch because of that. So that's 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 the optimistic side of looking at it. Um, but I, I think there's no question that it'll make a difference and it will make a difference as Topeka said to to other industries. So we have we have other non power sector industries here in the state that that are looking at this. Um, and I, I think it will spur it will just it will spur projects where we didn't expect them before. We we have so many incoming questions. I really want to get to those in just a minute, but I do want to take just a second and talk about CO2 removal. Um, increasingly, we know that uh, reaching net zero climate targets requires very large amounts of CO2 removal. Uh, almost certainly requires a combination of nature-based pathways like. Uh, trees uh, and soils as managed ecosystems, but also engineered pathways, things like biomass carbon removal with storage, bioenergy with CCS, direct air capture. Um, because of its energy resources and because of its uh, CO2 storage resources, Wyoming seems like a pretty interesting place to think about these things. Uh, from both a technical, operational, and sort of business perspective, and also in, in the context of the president's plans, how do you all think about CO2 removal in the context of the state and how can it be accelerated and supercharged? We'll say um, the state is really interested in this topic. Um, I, um, ranchers across the state are looking at a way of ranching for a profit. It's, it's kind of a joke, but not really. I mean, we're looking at anything we can do to help the ag sector. Um, th there is our already existing models as well, like sage grouse credits that that are um, accessible. So the state legislature is actually, I don't know if anything will happen with it, but they are looking at um, a bill that the state could become um, uh, maybe a verifier of carbon credits. I don't know if that will go anywhere, but I, I would just say whether you're talking about forestry um, practices that could provide bioenergy to combine with uh, CO2 storage, um, so BEX or, or soil carbon or uh, forest management or invasive species. I think we all see it as a broader um, industry that we can build here in Wyoming. 
and that might surprise a lot of people to hear that out of this state, but it, it really is something we're we're looking at because we have so much land um, that that is generally um, undisturbed and where we could we could um, do these practices. So, right, and these practices include things like multi paddock grazing or adaptive multi paddock grazing, uh, addition of biochar to soils. And again, I know that your university has a great deal of expertise in, in these subjects as well. So I look forward to what comes out of that. Deepika, how, how do you think about these things in terms of opportunities for services and for companies? Yeah, as I was saying, it, you know, I am uh, sort of new to the uh, uh, nature-based side, but in terms of carbon removal, I think, you know, going back to the points we were making about storage as a resource, I think putting carbon capture closer to storage could even, you know, uh, help because you're now avoiding the cost of, you know, transportation. Um, and, you know, it, it really matters where the energy, uh, clean energy might be available for direct air capture. I think um, some of these, um, projects could use up some, you know, would, would require land as well. So, um, you know, having that access, having access to quite a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a larger uh, footprint in terms of uh, for direct air capture. So I think um, that could be an opportunity, but also touching upon the soils point that I was making earlier, which is that I think that there might be some regulatory opportunities to modify or avoid a, a provide flexibility to ranchers that access um, land owned by the federal government, uh, allowing them to modify practices that can enable increased um, soil uh, carbon storage that can then allow for them to access the voluntary carbon market and get paid for those uh, activities uh, beyond their you know, current income uh, streams. So I think that those are opportunities that I definitely see. And there's a you know, growing emerging market that is uh, you know, really looking for supply of such removals and wants to pay for it uh, in the voluntary space. And I think that that's an opportunity that is currently you know, ready for, for, it's like ripe, I would say, to take advantage of. Uh, Sarah, your thoughts on CO2 removal, and mm -hmm. uh, it, particularly in the context of uh, the president's uh, uh, American Jobs Plan and others. Yes. So one of the things we highlighted in the report that I think is, is worth reiterating here is that some, that, so first of all, CDR is necessary for, for achieving climate goals. There are a few of the CDR approaches, including direct air capture and BECS, which bioenergy with CCS, which also require geologic storage. So responsible CCUS, whether or not it's CDR, enables future, future CDR. And one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, irresponsible deployment or bad experiences with, with, with CCS can constrain future CDR. Um, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act had a lot of incentives and money for clean energy, um, including 62 billion for DOE. Um, and part of that is for work in CDR and specifically direct air capture. And on Monday, the Department of Energy released a request for information. And that's open until um, mid-January, January 24th. Um, and and what, they're, what they'll do is they'll collect information from people such as yourselves um, about the about direct air capture and other emerging carbon management CDR approaches and use that to help design the program that will flow from the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Thank you. Excellent. And in fact, uh, one of the provisions already enacted in the bipartisan infrastructure package is the $3.5 billion for three direct air capture hubs. I'm sure that Wyoming yeah. is thinking about that as an opportunity as well. Sheila, anything you want to add, not just in terms of the policies, but also maybe U.S. competitiveness, maybe uh, uh, sort of American leadership, other questions around this? Absolutely. I think that this could be a model for other parts of the world, that the technology, uh, the methodology, uh, and the, the process that, that has pulled this together could be utilized in other countries, certainly in the countries we work with that are heavily coal dependent. Uh, this would be a lifeline 
to uh, assist them as they transition to other forms of energy. This could certainly be a lifeline, uh, whether it, it would be permanent or whether it would be a 25 year plan, uh, who knows where the world will be then, but um, I think it is uh, something that's adaptable in many, many circumstances that we see, particularly uh, Eastern Europe, uh, but not only there. Certainly India is a natural for this to be explored in. Um, India is uh, is confronted with the fact that it that is extremely coal dependent, that a very significant portion of the population has no electric power whatsoever, uh, and basically they're willing to take whatever electric power they can get from whatever source they can get it. Still, uh, and there's other parts of the world where the energy poverty uh, is just so so heartbreaking, uh, and is a is an impediment for those countries to be a part of the, of the modern world. To say nothing of improving just the the life of of uh, people and and preservation of the environment. They they basically are in positions where they have to take whatever if take whatever energy form is available, and it's sometimes it's not very pretty what transpires. We try to go into those countries and and to assist them in making that transition, but. Uh, uh, your tax dollars at work can only go so far. There's an enormous uh, amount of uh, U.S. taxpayer money that's going into this right now. Uh, but if we could take the ideas here and move them around the world to enable a, a more rapid transition to lower uh, CO2 emissions, it, it would be a godsend. So just thinking not just domestically, but international good this could do for the world. Thank you so much. Uh, as much as I love asking questions of my own to this extraordinary panel, uh, we have uh, an enormous range of questions already, uh, some of which we've tried to get to, but there's many we are just starting in. Again, if you would like to add a question, please do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I want to start with one question from Kate Bosler, uh, who asked, can you address the critique that CCS will lead to mitigation deterrence? meaning the appearance of some other option that makes mitigation of climate change less critical. If anybody would like to start in on that. Sarah, maybe you want to start, but anybody's welcome. I'd be happy to. Um, so ultimately, we need all, all of the approaches if we're going to address climate change. And, and one of the areas where it's particularly important and where CCS has a has a critical role to play is is in the ind industrial sector. Um, you know, high temperature heat is is needed to drive industrial activity, and process emissions from chemical reactions are are difficult to address. And, and CCS is is one way we we can get at that. Um, we've also talked a little bit about CDR, including direct air capture, and and I'll highlight that you know direct air capture is is one way we can get at some of the transportation emissions that are not being addressed by the transition to electric vehicles. Thanks. Others? I'd say um, I totally agree. We, we need all these options. I would point to the, the broad infrastructure needs um, to, to you if you choose only one or two options uh, as, as climate mitigation technologies. So, um, and we're doing all the above in Wyoming. So we, for example, we have a um, power company in Wyoming is building a 3,300 megawatt wind farm. They've been working on that that in, in the transmission associated to take it to the West Coast for 10 years. So if you're talking about grid scale, um, holistic change, like using some of the infrastructure you already have, and we are still big believers in CCS on the power sector here in Wyoming, um, using your existing infrastructure can speed up that process. We're doing all everything at once. We, you know, we're also working on um, one of the first new nuclear reactor, first of a kind demonstration will be in Kemmerer, Wyoming, where a coal plant's closing. So it is all of the above. And, and I would point to how long it takes to get big projects built, including transmission lines in the U.S., um, yeah. to understand why you do need CCS for industry and for the power sector and for carbon removal. Go ahead, Just look at the situation in Maine. That that is a, a, a perfect lesson as to hard it, how hard it is to get major infrastructure built, or even modest infrastructure for that matter. But but the the power line through Maine, uh, which would bring uh, clean energy from Canada through. Uh, and had been approved by everybody under the sun, and it, but then it went to the voters, and the voters 
uh, shut it down. If you look to the pipeline, natural gas pipeline into New York State, uh, huge amount of can uh, gas, natural gas in, uh, in Canada uh, easily come down to serve uh, the city of New York. And, and that was uh, uh, put to sleep too. But it's extremely frustrating. And it is, you know, it's the beauty of living in a democracy, but it also is the pain of living in democracy, a complex democracy where everybody has a place at the table, everybody, uh, and where something which maybe in a national energy plan uh, just uh, hits the wall when it comes to a state or part of a state. Uh, so we just have got to keep working through this. And a lot of it is, is education, information, and why things, why particular projects are critical, important, and can improve the environment, can improve um, the CO2 emission situation. But it is extremely painful because there's disbelief, there's cynicism, and there's players that uh, uh, no matter what it is, uh, it will be any major infrastructure project will be objected to uh, in any uh, in any forum in which they they can find to do it. And you know, that's our democracy at work, but it, it can be frustrating at times. Go ahead. Can I, uh, make a point also, um, Julio. Um, I, so I think that, you know, this is a, a question that I find, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything uh, Sarah said and Holly said that we do need all of the technologies and carbon capture has a very unique uh, value in that, that it can, it, it's, it's not a generating technology. So it's not really like you can't compare apples to apples when you say, when you compare sort of renewable energy technology with carbon capture, because this is a pollution control technology. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, we're, we're just removing the CO2. Um, and it's important because some of these industries will, um, uh, you know, are, have emissions that cannot be replaced with clean energy. It's just, it's coming from the chemistry of making cement or, or steel. Um, and as, as Holly said, it's, it's about using the existing infrastructure and trying to sort of uh, avoid the issues of CO2 emissions. But the other thing is also that, um, CCS is, um, you know, it, it, it's also an opportunity in the sense of like utilization. I think that there's a, a whole new closed loop economy that can be built around it. And also some of these projects where CCS will go, it could cost like a billion dollars to do CCS. It's sort of like hard to think about from a business decision point of view. It's hard to think about like putting CCS on sort of an old plant that is better to shut down in the in the near term given that we're all expecting a carbon constrained world we're all expecting to mm -hmm. you know reduce our co2 uh, to keep you know uh, i can't imagine a decision being made to sort of add ccs on a project that is i you know that probably might be better to shut down and i just wanted to point out that typically decisions to put ccs on will always you know uh, be targeted towards plants that will survive for at least the next 20 years. And in that case, you'd rather have CCS rather than not, uh, or ha and have that facility continue to emit emissions. So I just wanted to point that out um, uh, from an age of infrastructure pers perspective. Yeah, the vintage uh, yeah. of the plant matters a great deal. Uh, we have a bunch of other questions. There's a quick one, I think, for uh, Dr. Krutka. It says, uh, this is from w Wambui, uh, Mutoru, I hope I got your name correct there, uh, ask from a commercial perspective, how do you see sort of dedicated saline storage as opposed to utilization, uh, either for products or for EOR playing out in Wyoming? Thanks for that question. So um, we see, it's a great question. We have a robust uh, EOR industry here that's already operating. Um, but we would see purely on economics likely that saline storage could take off if we can resolve our, our federal pore space leasing issue. In the meantime, I think that we'll continue to see EOR projects moving forward. And, uh, and so uh, I, wanna, saline, I just wanna yeah. explore that just a little bit. Yeah. What I thought I heard you just say mm -hmm. is that the barrier to saline storage is not strictly financial, that there's also a regulatory and access mm -hmm. issue that needs to be resolved. I do, yes. I do. I, I, yes, that's, that's correct. I, I do think there's some spots, some locations in the state where saline projects will move forward. Um, but if there are federal lands in the area, then, then there might be a, um, a more likelihood in the near term to, um, at least till we have this leasing issue um, figured out, um, 
to, to tend toward EOR. But I, I think from economics that we believe saline storage is, is a winner. A somewhat related topic, perhaps. Uh, this is from Chris Davis. The question is, do you anticipate legal legislative proposals for the state to assume long-term liability for CO2 sequestration? And what might that mean? Would love there to is, get uh, Sarah's and Sheila's thoughts on the same topic afterwards, but you first, Holly. Yeah, there is there is a bill moving forward. I do not know if it will succeed. I think there may be constitutional issues, but we'll see it as modeled on what North Dakota has already done um, to um, after 10 years post the last injection for the state to look at liability. So that uh, that could be reviewed um, and taken up in our legislative session in um, February and March next year. I hate to say set aside, but maybe just a set aside uh, going forward for such contingencies might be uh, might be one way to get through the eye of the needle. Also under consideration. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like what California does. There is um, for, under the permanence protocol within the state of California, um, a project will have to uh, contribute to a buffer pool for credits. But that that only I think that works differently because it's a market here for of credits and. There's a contribution, uh, I think it's up to like 7% right now. Um, it, I don't know, that might change or, um, and some people do believe it's really high uh, because, you know, people are aware that, you know, this is, we know how, we know how to select the right sites that prevent leakage. So 7% is super high, but that could be something that can be discussed, but that is a format that, that California uses to uh, have projects contribute to buffer pool, to have that contingency, but also have rigorous site selection rules and requirements that would prevent some sort of leakage in the future. Um, and I guess focus on prevention is really where the, the um, yeah, that's the main key. Uh, we do actually have a comment, so not a question that... from, oh, go ahead, Sarah, you first. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. I'll say the CEQ report highlights some of this, the diversity in ways that states have addressed long-term liability in ways that work within their state law and how property rights are, are dealt with in the state and how industry works in that state. I do want to make the point that sometimes people use the term long-term liability when the issue is really around financial assurance and the financial assurance requirements that the that come along with the permitting in many ways um, operating the ccs project is similar to operating any similar industrial project such as in the oil and gas industry and projects can purchase insurance products through the market just like they would for normal operations um, and happy to um, happy to provide more detail but the report does articulate a few of the creative ways different states have dealt with um, what happens after the financial assurance in the out years. Outstanding. And again, that report is in the chat function for all to take a look at. Uh, I did want to highlight quickly a comment we received from Noel Lika in California. I think I pronounced her name correctly there. It says, we are working to define poor space ownership in California with the California legislature and to assist utilization definitions for land acquisition. Uh, Noel Lika Project 2030. So uh, Wyoming is by no means alone. And as Sarah said, many states are trying to do uh, all of this. Um, uh, other questions here. It says, can you please, uh, this is an interesting one. I, I don't like generally pitting state against state, but we are seeing some of this coming up. Uh, what, l l Texas, California, and uh, Louisiana are all barreling forward on, on CCS. And in fact, we have had seminars just like this. We have a question here from uh, Gabriel uh, Abgerinos, I think is his name. Can you please discuss CCS opportunities in terms of sources and sinks in Wyoming versus Texas? Does Texas have specific advantages uh, where many emitters may be uh, poised to take action? And thinking here, uh, perhaps uh, Deepika, you first uh, yeah. in terms of how commercial operator may think about this and then maybe uh, uh, Sarah and Sheila. Yeah, I think um, the, the 
there might be, you know, there might be more st storage volume or, uh, uh, in Texas area than relative to Wyoming, but that shouldn't be an issue because it's, you know, multiple hundreds of years of worth of storage anyway. So it's not a, that's not a constraining factor. But what I think the key difference might be is, you know, just how easy it might be to access that all of that space. Because I think with Texas, the offshore storage, it, uh, uh, is actually owned by one single owner and that's the federal government as opposed to like what holly was mentioning about the checkerboard um situation in in wyoming with multiple different landowners that might just be a different kind of hurdle to to um to to jump over uh and i think that those are the that i, I feel like speaks to one of the biggest uh issues of like how easily it would how easily can a private owners um get access or have a have an agreement with the owner of the land um mm -hmm. and and clarity in terms of you know who owns poor space and who owns and you know what can can is it poor space you know can you inject into the poor space and who owns what's in there mm -hmm. uh, and liability as well so i was going to go to sarah anyways but uh deepika just mentioned one of the other agencies that you have to deal with in addition to blm do you want to talk about boem and how you think about that Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I, will, I will say that I've actually seen Wyoming as a leader in the state policy CCS space for some time. They were actually, um, I, if I, my memory serves correct, Wyoming was the first state to address this issue of poor space ownership um, at the state level and to make it clear um, who owns the poor space in, in Wyoming. The issues with federal lands are you know, regarding the process for permitting and working with agencies. And Wyoming's also led in that regard. Um, I mentioned the FAST 41 project for CO2 pipelines. Wyoming also through the pipeline um, infrastructure authority, um, you know, worked on, on corridors for CO2 pipelines. And so I think, in, and I've talked about the, the general benefits for, for Wyoming. I think similarly, Texas, California, and other states have their distinct advantages. You know, California has, um, they have a permanence protocol for CCS and there's the opportunity for, um, for CCS to play into the alternative fuels. They're in, 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 in Texas, there are tremendous opportunities in the offshore and also some state level legislate, legislative actions that have been taken. And so I, I think which state, you know, is the most ahead really depends on where your business operations are um, and, and whether the provisions that have been tackled by the state legislature address the issues that you're facing in a project specific way. Um, with respect to, um, to Department of Interior's um, BOEM, and the offshore CCS, I mentioned this earlier, uh, but the Infrastructure and Jobs Act provided clarity on the process for leasing poor space in the offshore and um, tasked the Department of Interior with promulgating regulations this year. Um, and, and it clarified some of the, the things that, that had been barriers to offshore CCS in the past. And, and so I think both for Louisiana and for Texas and other um, other states that that may want to access poor space in the outer continental shelf, some of those barriers um, were resolved by legislation this year. Thank you. Excellent. Sheila, final thoughts on this? Yes, uh, you've got uh, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, all of them could benefit from it. Uh, and of course, you've got the uh, three mile uh, is uh, state water and beyond that is federal. So the federal government could do a lot that maybe the state government can't do or the vice versa. And on behalf of Wyoming, let me say that Wyoming was the first state in the union to vote uh, for the 19th amendment. So, <laughs> so Wyoming has been a later all the way through. Um, so vis-a-vis uh, -vis the offshore, there is so much work that needs to be done just in the cleanup uh, from the, the um, wild uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, that's still being done. There's an opportunity that that can be done uh, and to utilize uh, the technology that uh, we're discussing here today to solve so many of the cleanup problems of the, uh, of the abandoned wells uh, and uh, the issues associated with them. So uh, while Wyoming is dry, uh, the lessons learned can certainly be adapted uh, to, a, to a marine environment. Uh, this allows me to tag then into the next two uh, topics I wanna touch on. We'll try to get these two questions in under the wire. The first from Holly Kaufman, 
the second from Kristen Cora. Uh, Holly asked a question, not just about uh, sort of cleanup, but prevention. She said, in addition, what might we be able to do to model for other countries that they can learn from uh, in terms of avoiding sort of things? So uh, one example is what can be done to prevent uh, environmental decimation? Uh, there's been parts of uh, Wyoming which have been uh, severely impacted environmentally and economically from infrastructure and energy development. Uh, can CCS be help used to not only restore these, but also what can be done to prevent a bad outcome? Perhaps Holly, start with you. Well, I'd just say, I, I think Wyoming is a leader in balancing energy production and environment. So, um, but I, I also think I would point to the land footprint associated with, with CCS projects versus some other energy technologies, very small. Um, but I, I think we have a lot of regulation here, both at the state and the federal level. And so demonstrate using those regulations, we're going to have to do this in, an, in a way that does not have big environmental impacts, and that's how we're going to show other countries how to do it. Excellent. Um, uh, there's actually a I question a... for Sarah. Go ahead, but you, you answer first, and then we'll pivot to Kristen's question. So, you know, this issue of international deployment of CCS and, and ensuring globally there's rigorous standards um, and, and permitting is something that, that I've worked on a lot over the years. Um, and, and so international standards um, for CCS have been developed um, and, and they're consistent with the, the permitting and, and regulatory framework in, in, in the United States. And I, I think, you know, beyond, you know, continuing to develop those and improve upon international best practices and standards, um, we, we also need to, to talk about when things don't go well. And, and share information both within our country and, and elsewhere and, um, and, and figure out how to, how to do better. That's a terrific pivot to, to the final question from Kristen Cora, not just sharing learnings and experiences, uh, but we have a specific question uh, with respect to technology transfer. Uh, what's the US position on tech transfer as well as policy innovation with a set of countries? Uh, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, Brazil, uh, for example, uh, Indonesia, how are we thinking about uh, not just uh, sharing learnings, but uh, sharing technology or transferring technology? So my work is, has been focused domestically. And um, what I'm about to say is not an official position. Uh, but what I will share is you know, over time, there, there has been active technical cooperation, um, both in country to country agreements, and, and I'm speaking um, to, to some of the work the Department of Energy has done between country to country agreements, and also collaboration on CCS technology as part of multilateral forums. Um, there's active work happening under the auspices of the International um, Energy Agency through its CCUS unit. Um, there's under the Clean Energy Ministerial, there's been a CCS action group that's been active. And the United States um, stood up the Carbon Sequestration Leadership Forum, which has long been a leading venue for countries to share technical knowledge, know-how, and experience on CCS technologies. Um, so I don't know if that directly gets at your question, but I, what I want to leave you with is there has been and is ongoing a great deal of technical collaboration and information sharing um, with, with, with our allies on, on CCS technologies. Sheila and Deepika, any last words on uh, IP sharing or competitiveness or anything like that? Well, certainly uh, USEA with the support and, and, uh, and funding from DOE, uh, USAID, state, uh, we're working in a variety of countries where ideas and technology, the, the sharing of them to help them improve their lot uh, and to, to uh, make it cleaner, more sophisticated, more accessible. That's, that's what we're about. That's, that's our core function. And so we are honored to, to work with, at the behest of and hand in hand with, the, with our government to, to make that happen. Last word. Nothing to add. Excellent. Well, 
Uh, I really wish we could do this for many more hours, uh, but we are at time. Please join me in thanking our speakers today, uh, Dr. Holly Krutka, Sarah Forbes, Sheila Hollis, and Deepika Nagabushan. Uh, uh, and thank you to the audience for tuning in as well and for sharing your thoughts and questions. As we mentioned at the beginning, a full video of this event will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policy's website in a few days. Our next event is China's energy transition. This will be held at Thursday, December 9th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. You can register on our website. For a full calendar of upcoming events, please visit the Center on Global Energy Policy online. Uh, we hope you will enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all and thank you again.